the point is, is that it does get, but they're like, no, nope, we're good. We want to go back. And I was like, fine, you know, we're done. We're done. We're done. I'm not doing this anymore. And then like, it could have been out of a movie. It was like, us like walking outside, being happy, coming back, sign like never again, never again. Welcome to Royal Path, and my name is Andrew, and I am the host, and tonight I'm going to ask Cyprian and Father Turbo, what is your favorite um, superhero or villain, whatever, costume? Like, what do you like, like, let's get like Batman and Captain America out of the way, like, because I think that those are the, the best, but I mean, I got a, a couple of them that I'm like, that's just a really solid costume, like or Taskmaster. Co okay, so it's the so the co uh, Taskmaster is pretty cool. Taskmaster is an awesome costume. And if mm. so, if, if you felt like throwing that in there, what's your favorite iteration of that costume? Is do you like a redesign later on? I I only know it relatively like sort of in the beginning, like the older oh, probably the, the oldest. I didn't. The one. Just yeah. the blue and then with the cowl and then the, the cowl. The cowl is what mask. kills it. Yeah, absolutely. The mask is just like, yeah, no, that's that's an amazing costume. Okay. Well, I mean it could be from the movies too. You know, it doesn't I matter. I mean, this this what's coming to my mind because it's it like if we're talking costume, then I'm thinking suit. Sure. So then I'm gonna say Iron Man, right? Oh, sure. No, I'm gonna say fine. Iron Man. What's your favorite that's Iron Man one though? um probably so not like the first first that's that that weird like clunky thing sure um there was one probably around what what year would this be probably like 90 early 90s 90 91 92 this is maybe okay. the third iteration i'm thinking okay and i remember really because i remember the age that i was i remember loving that look has it got the, it hips on the hips on the it disc? hip yeah the it disc hips yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. 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 I think that's Seeker Orr's Iron Man. Like the, um, he had just lost the angular, mm -hmm. angular mask, and so it's all just like a round thing. He's got the disc. Yeah, that's that's a good one. That, I like that one. I've that's always liked that. I, I think it's nostalgia though, more than anything. Okay. I haven't really sat and thought about. I haven't laid them all out next to each other and been like, which is more aesthetically pleasing. It's just like. Which one is Iron Man to me? I do that so much that I'll have to give word for it. Like someday, yeah. like I'd be like, you could have sacrificed about 30% of this time you thought about this stuff and thought about something, <laughs> or something instead. And now I was like, yeah, I, I probably should have. But, I mean, Taskmaster, Dr. Doom, of course, Dr. Doom's costume is absolutely- They're kind of similar. They're kind of, they have to, yeah, I, I, I see your, I see your vibe here. I, seem I to see have what a you're going, going for. Going yeah, so you have a vibe. Yeah. yeah. What about you, father? Yeah, um, I, I'm gonna have to go with um, you know I'm a big I'm a big Black Panther fan. I mean, mm. Jack Kirby's Black Panther, uh, no cape. but even the um, I'm trying to remember his first name. I just know him as Priest. His that's his name. His last name is Priest. Christopher Priest. Christopher Priest. The Christopher Priest version. Yeah. Um, with the gold um yeah the gold claws you know and the the, the kind of like uh the almost like dracula like mini cape yeah and um it's like super great um that's a king right there yeah and i love it because it's like it's not a costume it's it's, it's his habit it's his priestly habit like yes. also you know what i mean so uh, yeah and it, yeah yeah, that's and I think, and I, I would just say this, the thing about Black Panther, uh, I mean, again, it's his habit, his priestly habit, it's his, his royal uniform, all that stuff, but it's like, 
it, it brings all this stuff together. Cause I mean, it's what you love about snake eyes. It's what you love. Oh about, yeah. Good you call. Know what I mean? Good call. Good it, call. It's what you, it's like when Spider-Man had the symbiote suit, it's like what you love about that. It's such a it's, great costume. It's, it's what you love about Batman. I mean, it's a great costume. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's really great. Normally I have a, I have a thing. I don't like it when people mess with Kirby's original stuff, but Black Panther, that's a good, that's an excellent costume. I know what you're talking about. That's an excellent one. And then Thor, I think Thor needed some updating as well. That original costume is pretty silly, but most of the time Kirby's originals are. Yeah. But the original costume fit in with the time though. I mean, it really, it really locks you, itself into that about, period of art. If, okay. I don't want to get into a whole thing here because we do have holy <laughs> things to talk about. If, if caught, if, comics had stayed the tone i want them to stay Mm. and thor's costume would have been perfect like keep Mm. it the way that it is but the way that comics went it did need to change at a certain point because now for a while during the end of jason aaron's run he didn't have the hat anymore he just Mm -hmm. had like short cut hair and then like a beard and like he had still like the armor and stuff he still looked really cool but tonally you couldn't have you know that same Thor come in and you know go for that what they were going for it would just be silly the the ridiculousness there's this brief little wonderful time Mm -hmm. about the time that a a comic called New Avengers was going I remember that but yes absolutely I remember that with Bendis with Brian Michael Bendis where you had those old costumes and they're Mm -hmm. still being drawn in a goofy way Mm -hmm. um but it was the tone, they were still kind of serious and like it worked, but then at a certain point it fell off the other side and then they needed to make everybody edgier and cooler and more sleek. Mm-hmm. Not in a nineties way, like not extreme, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna fall into the weeds here if I don't stop. But Captain America's Jack Kirby's, you know, obviously that is my favorite costume of all time, but then uh, a, a favorite superhero costume really quick off the bat i would say i really like i can't think of anything not one particular one off the top of my head that i love more than any other because one. captain america is just jumping into your consciousness too hard i mean he does tend to occupy a lot of space when he, when he <laughs> leaves in with a shield throwing things about i mean oh oh um no what is it um oh man i just had it for one second I can't remember. It'll, I have to stop thinking about it, but it'll come back to me. But I mean, the Fantastic Four's costumes are absolutely awesome. Anyway, I got to stop. I really okay. got to stop. All right. Well, then, then let me, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll break us out of that and I'll get us into where we are. We're back on the, so the guy out of this yeah, we're, we're back on the creed. We're back on the creed now. So just yeah. to get us all caught up because we took two weeks, two weeks off, mm-hmm. I, I believe. Yeah. So uh, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten not made, of one essence with the Father by whom all things were made. Now this is where we are. Uh, oh no, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the, of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man, and who was crucified for us also under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. So that's where we're at. But I think there's probably three episodes in that sentence. Yeah, my Uh initial thoughts were, was the costume I was thinking of was the Cyclops. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I just had to say it. (laughs) But when he's still wearing the hat. Out the top, but when he still got the head over the top. Oh, <laughs> but, uh, oh that's amazing. <laughs> my initial thoughts were that we had already kind of covered a little bit, and we certainly could spend more time talking about it. Uh, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. And was no, crucified, for, crucified us. for us. Yeah. But we had already spoke on the crucifixion. We certainly could keep going with that. That's absolutely no problem. I, I, I was I was hoping that we could talk about because while we've talked about the crucifixion and we have talked a bit about the cross, I feel like having we would be remiss 
if we didn't have an episode about the cross, especially since we talked so much about symbols last time. So about the crucifixion, about the symbol of the cross, hmm. how we should understand the symbol of the cross. We could talk about, I mean, I'm interested to know more about the sign of the cross. Oh, you know, yeah. uh, all, all, of, all of these things, I think, would be very, very helpful for the people who are, who are listening because I think that although although the cross is clearly the i mean it is the symbol of christianity that most people would understand i think people coming from a protestant background evangelicals aren't making the sign of the cross really uh, it's just not it's you know i mean there may be a cross but i think the relationship with an orthodox person to the cross is going to be is different. It's become different for me. My understanding of the cross and it's it, what it represents and the, the role that it's playing in my prayer is like totally different. So I don't know, Father. This these are these are these are my thoughts, but I'm just very, very curious about Pontius Pilate. That's where I wanted to take it. Me but too. I think the cross is a good thing. Of course, we could always keep talking about it. And like, yeah, I know shockingly little about the sign of like where did why did we start doing that? You know, like I don't I don't really know you know, like, you know, the sign of the cross and like, you know, we, we had talked about it before, but I'm, I'm certainly down to keep talking about it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, think, man. I mean, Oh, there's so many places we can go with it. Um, you know, I, I think, I think this is a great place to begin to speak a little bit about um, tradition and I think this is a great time to start speaking about the the reality of, you know, you know, if you're not, even if you're born, quote unquote, into the Orthodox Church, there's always a a, a measuring of entering into it. There's there's some point in time in which, you know, it's not an uncommon saying about everyone needs to convert, you know, this idea that at some point in time, you need to have some sort of kind of conversion where you, you become very aware, almost self-conscious uh, in a particular way about, you know, your relation to Christ and, and the church and understanding the church as, um, as a people, as a nation as a race and uh, a history and a culture and all those things. And, and there are things that are, you know, you're given and you're initiated into that, I mean, really have their, have, have a, their own kind of unique, you know, history. Um, like the sign of the cross and the fact that, St. Basil the Great, he, he talks about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, you know, kind of just summarize uh, what he says, but he basically says, you know, like, where does this come from? You know, he, he says like, where is it that we learn, you know, the, the, the formula for, for baptism? Where is it that we, we learn, you know, the, the words of liturgy, like all these things he begins to talk about. He's, and he basically, he starts alluding to all these things are given to us in tradition. These things are were revealed to us. So much of it was revealed to us by Christ. Um, and Christ revealed to the church these, these things that we tend to look at as just simply kind of with an earthly origin. But it's deeper than that. Um, it's never outside of history in the sense that there's a definite historical point where these things, you know, are, are kind of like birthed into, into practice and, you know, it begins to change. Um, it begins to change and develop the, the culture of the church, but at the same time, they aren't just these, you know, purely human phenomena that just kind of like happen, like accidents of history, like other cultural things. So I think this is a great, great opportunity to talk about that because on the one hand we could talk about Pontius Pilate and we could talk about um, the relationship of the church 
to government authority and the relationship of the because Pontius Pilate representing that government authority. And we can talk about where does that come from? And, and you know, the, the, the church has always been very explicit about that. Um, we could also go into this place. We start talking about, you know, Pontius Pilate's wife and yeah. what happened to her and, and, the, and the history well, well, there. Maybe, I mean, can we, can we start, can we start there? That sounds, that sounds like a, that sounds like an entry point. And then I, I'm sure that we'll be guided back to wherever we're supposed yeah. to go. I just got to say really, really quick that the reason why I'm attracted to this right now is because I've always seen Pontius Pilate as, um, and, I, and I probably need to be corrected on this, which is just as one of the one, you know, hey, let's correct Andrew live for the salvation of, you know, our subscribers, you know, whatever, that's fine. But like, he's always been this figure of like, he wasn't evil he like was not good and like i don't know if he outright was like malicious because i mean like at the same time christ did speak to him like he said something back and like to that point you know like you know uh of course i can't remember just like i couldn't remember the dang costume the king he spoke to before he wouldn't say anything Herod? yeah 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 um the but he talked to Herod, wouldn't say anything. And the, but then he says something to Pontius Pilate. And then you have this weird part where Pontius Pilate's wife is like, I had a dream about this guy last night. And like, you know, he's troubling. So I just thought it's really, really interesting. It's like just enough to like peek what's going on there. So yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, um, and and to be frank, I mean, I there is, I guarantee, you know, there's there's annals of tradition <laughs> that we could explore here that that I'm not that I'm not as privy to either. I know that we know that um, Pilate's wife, you know, she had I, I can't remember her name, uh, but she did. Herod. What's that? I said it's Herod, but I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not Herod. Although, <laughs> although if you. One of the things I've always really enjoyed about the uh, Mel Gibson rendition of, of the Passion is the depiction of Herod. The way they, they depicted Herod in that in that movie is really, <laughs> really good because he's this super kind of weird effeminate thing. But anyways, um, so she she actually. Um, she kind of represents to some degree this um, this righteous, the, the, uh, she, she represents the type of righteousness in many ways because again, she had this dream and she said, you know, have nothing to do with this man. But if memory kind of serves me correctly, um, she did go on to have a, she did go on to have kind of like a righteous end um, in regards of, um, proclaiming Christ, but Pilate's the interesting one insofar as he represents this, um, you know, this, this moment when the Lord says, if, if you are, you're either for me or you're for against me, you know, if you're not for me or against me, this, this inability to be neutral towards Christ, we see this really kind of brought forward uh, with Pilate, you know, in the, in the kind of washing of the hands um, and this refusal to, to take a stand, this refusal to um, acknowledge, you know, truth. I mean, this is the famous thing he says, you know, what is truth. But I find it really interesting because in many ways, this inability to recognize the, the authority of, of God, um, this is, Pilate represents, you know, like all of the all the kingdoms uh, of the world in many ways who have continually rejected the reign of Christ. And we see it, I think, um, in, a, in a weird way, we see what happens when uh, um, a culture or a government is able to actually repent of it in like, let's say Russia, where in the, in the Soviet times and this rejection of Christ and this very, almost pilot-esque disposition it seems like the the soviets took and how that led to a really terrible end 
Um, and then now in this flowering, however you want to look at it, you know, but there's a flowering of, of orthodoxy uh, in Russia again. And there's, there is a, there is a embracing of what Christ represents at the very least. Um, if you want to be cynical about it, at the very least, it's that, if not a, an actual embracing. Um, and then you see the fruit of it. And you see the fruit of, of what happens when there is a, um, a very affirmative stance. So I think it's, I think it's a, a great point to launch into kind of understanding um, this temptation, because this gets into a lot of things that people get fascinated with in regards to like uh, the Byzantine Empire and Symphonia, you know, the double-headed eagle, the balance of, of the state and the church and, and how that plays into what does that look like? And, and I think, um, you know, we have in Pontius Pilate this kind of like warning, a little bit of a warning sign there and, and, and the true character of earthly government is kind of revealed in, in his uh, person in the gospel, you know? There, the, would you say, Father, that, that Pilate represents, maybe if we were to, to look at where the, the, like to say like the pattern of Pilate or the spirit of Pilate, mm -hmm. it seems to me that there's the, this, that he, he represents, although there was no like, maybe there was secularity at that time, but maybe what I would say is that like he represents this sort of a secular, this secular spirit in that he's able to deny Christ and saying like, well, I wash my hands of this. So like, I'm not responsible for, for the actions that I'm taking because I'm taking them within this framework of mine that has nothing to do with you and nothing to do with your people and nothing to do with your sort of your beliefs and all of that. And it seems very much like the what's going on it's very reminiscent of what's been going on the last two years of saying, well, no, here are these laws that are based on science and we're going to do these things. And if, you know, if it means closing the doors to a church, if it means you can't have the Eucharist, if it means these sacraments cannot be made that like, still we're innocent of that because we don't have, that's not about us. Mm -hmm. That's not like, that's, you, it, it doesn't, those things like, that's like a, a hobby that you have or something like that. Right. Or, uh, right. You know, like, right. it's just like, well, we closed the stores. Right. We did these other right. things. Like, is there, a, is there an analog there for that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you've put your finger on it really well. Um, and, and the reason, the reason why I feel I want to go there and I think that's where we should go is because um, this is, I, this is, for us, right, in, in this context of our conversation and, and, and what we're always doing here is like, for me, I think it's really great and important to see how the scriptures and what's revealed in the scriptures and, and what's revealed and, and with the church, how that relates to us now, you know, and, and not just looking at these things um, in an exclusively kind of like historical light, but really, you know, what is the symbol behind it? What is, what are the metaphors that, what are the the, in some regards, the, the kind of anagogical understanding of these things, where are they leading us ultimately to? If we begin to look at who does, you know, what does Pilate represent? And I think you've nailed it on the head. And I think what you see in this, the thing that's interesting is this idea, the world, and you see, you see a lot of people, a lot of Christians, the people in the church, they want to ape this secular mentality the secular disposition which is a neutral disposition like pilot mm -hmm. they don't they don't they don't recognize it but this is what they want to hate this neutral position it's like um a great example there was this absolutely absurd statement that was released by LD before us um who's the the archbishop for the greek orthodox uh, greek archdiocese of america Speaking about abortion, it was just, oh, it, was, yeah. it was as, it was one of the most double-minded, duplicitous things like you've ever read. It's, it, and this, it's this, this is a great thing here because like for us, I was thinking about this actually the other day, you know, with the royal path, it's not about being in the, this, this kind of mushy middle of just being the middle of the road just for the sake of being nice 
and not being willing to take a side is actually not that at all. It's, it's the harder thing to do, which is not to fall into the error of extreme. So let's just be clear that that's not what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about uh, a, a mushy middle, a, a, a very washed out unwillingness to, to take a stand for the sake of just trying to be neutral and get along and, and to, to appease both sides, you know, this is, this is yeah, precisely, agree, agree to disagree, agree to let's disagree. Just, let's, let's just agree to disagree. Yeah. Probably. I mean, this is, this is really, the, this is that spirit of pilot. Um, Isn't there like a special place in Dante's circle of hell for fence sitters or something like that? Like people who refuse to take a stance or something. I can't remember. I thought I remember that. I know that's not orthodox, but. I mean, I don't. It's been a while since I've read the Inferno, but yeah, it, it's it's a real problem. And people people find themselves. I mean, on the face of it, it seems as if it's the the reasonable position, but what you find is it's not a position at all, and it, and it really has more to do with a, a kind of. Um, not only does it lack courage, but it, it, it lacks love. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it doesn't. It doesn't display any any true, any true love, uh, one way or the other, and any conviction. And I, I think this is the thing that really um, turns a lot of people away from so much of kind of mainstream religion, mainstream Christianity, anyways, is because it's this very washed out, mealy mouthed thing that doesn't represent anything you know it, it's 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 this lukewarm reality you know be hot or cold if not i'll spit you out of my mouth and i think for a lot of people this is this is really antithetical to what they're what they're looking for when they come to the church because what they find in the church is they find something affirmative something that is that stands for something all, all of these great points but ultimately something that's true and truth can never be neutral. And I think this, I mean, again, getting back to Pontius Pio when he says, well, what is truth, you know? And he asks that question, not with, uh, he's not authentically curious and wanting to know what truth is. Hmm. Hmm. That, that's, that's the, that's the, the trick. That's the key. It's, cynic, it's a cynical, he's like, cynical. Well, what's true? Well, what's truth? <laughs> he's cynical. He's cynical. And, this cynicism, this is what's behind so much of the spirit of what you find, quote unquote, religious people doing these days. I mean, the cynicism is why they just go along with whatever the government had said or did or like, OK, I can close church. It's not a big deal. Or, or you're just being extreme in your position. It's like that's that's a very cynical position um, because like. Christ before Pilate, you know, truth doesn't, this is, this is the thing. Truth is, it has a very interesting way of going to war in silence, R real truth. Real truth doesn't need to beat a drum. Real truth pierces in its, in its, in its silence. And people know in their heart when they are moving against truth, you know? And I, I think this is why in many ways um, you see such a kind of clamoring, especially on the left, is because all these people, we talked about this before with, um, there was this like, I can't remember, it was, you know, whichever cable, HBO or, Show, or Showtime, whatever, with um, this expose on all these transgender kids, right? And it was like always the mom. It was like always the mom who was like, the kids were just being dragged along by the mom. And you could see that there, that there was a real denial of truth in the actions of these moms. There was no real love, of there's no love there. And there was a real denial when they, when they would see the kid just kind of like, I just want to kind of like not do this anymore. This isn't fun anymore. You know, all, all, all of these, all these little kind of breakdowns in the in the charade would happen. And I, I think this is what happens for a lot of people 
who are pushing so hard, especially on the left right now in this time is because you have to fight so hard because the truth is just so silently saying, this is absurd. You like, you know, this is absurd. Whatever it is, whatever extreme thing you want to try to push, whether it's, you know, the, the myriads of genders, the myriads of identity, whatever it is, it, it, it flies in the face of what people know is true in their gut. And I think this is one of the big things about being careful with engagement, getting back to what our Lord did and being silent. I'm not a really a big fan of engaging in debate, in, to be frank with you, because I, I find that it's, it's disingenuous and oftentimes it's very cynical. People like Pilate, they don't really want to know truth. They just want to kind of argue and, and sometimes arguing becomes the place by which they can further kind of harden their hearts and further. You're talking maybe, about debating in a religious sense? Debating in a religious sense on a philosophical level, like these, these things, um, they never are fruitful. What's yeah, what's someone... the, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in the last two years, this what you're saying is it, like it struck me it's it struck me so i'm sorry to interrupt but it struck me so hard that i just wanted to express like the the you can tell the truth because when i've seen the truth with all the absurdity going on has not been the people who like have had the charts and graphs and the 50 page essays and the, all of this and the, you know somebody who does you know 27 hours on critical theory and all of this it's the person who just says no. Mm -hmm. It's the person who's like, you know what? No, mm -hmm. no, that's mm -hmm. not happening. Not with me, not with my kids. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. And you feel that you feel like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's there's a solid foundation there. And that foundation is truth. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think for some people. They come to a place also where. Um, Maybe they're not quite repenting of it, but they're waking from from the just the anxiety of always having to keep up <laughs> with whatever the new thing is. You know what I mean? And they just go like, "I'm I'm just I'm I'm done." You know? And that's the thing about being based, right? And just like someone is just just saying it like it is. And and, and I think I think this is what speaks to. Um, I mean, I came in on it. I walked in on your guys' conversation about Missouri, but like being a, a native Southern Californian cat coming to Missouri, one of the great things that I've just have always, I've had fallen in love about Missouri is just, just based, it's just like this, it is what it is. You get what you, you kind of see what you get with people here. And and I, I mean that in, in a good way. Um, that that almost act, there's an aspect of it almost like the kind of like salt of the earth thing like this is i take that as a compliment by the yeah, way yeah I, I i i do too you know and it's it's also one of the things that i think when people especially if you're fortunate enough to be um in a parish or in a community that has a lot of um slobs in it i i find it in particular you know or like a lot of you know um you know, working class Greeks and stuff like you, you'll find this kind of just calling it for what it is. Um, and for a lot of people who are enamored with the, the kind of sophisto and the gloss of the, of the coasts and that, you know, that kind of sheen, that plasticness that people really kind of chase after on the coasts, you know, you don't, they don't go for that. And, 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 Coming from that, it's just so refreshing to to see, um, even if it's a little rough, even if it isn't, you know, sophisticated. It's just like it's so honest, and and I think this is the thing that when people begin to actually encounter God, you know, when they begin to move past the those kind of first initial stages of phenomena, where it's like I don't know what it was, but something hit me, or I had a feeling, or some experience, you know. When you actually start getting into knowing who God is, you begin to understand, experience God's character through the scriptures, through the lives of the saints, you know, and, and to be frank, you know, through prayer, you begin to discover this, 
honesty. You know, what I mean, you see it in the character of Christ when you read the scripture. You see it in the character of Christ when he's dealing with with Pontius Pilate. You see it with his his refusal to go there with the Pharisees so often. His refusal to get kind of he never gets caught up in their games and plays the slick games with them like ever. You know, and and I think this is this is a really important thing because when you start getting into this idea about authentic life and being an authentic person, um, Christ really reveals that in this exchange between Pontius Pilate. And there's, again, it's, I think we've talked about this before, but it's in his silence that so much of that is revealed. You know what I mean? It's just, it, it's an unwillingness to engage in the tomfoolery, you know? And this is, <laughs> This is so much of what you see the demons doing these games, right? Well, I mean, look, going back to the garden, did God really say, Yeah. right? That characteristic of like, well, you know, and it's just like, shut up, man. You know, don't, you just want to say, just shut up. You, you can feel, you can feel the seductive slickness just trying to, to, to wrap you up in it. And I'm repenting of that father. That's a, that's, that was me. Like that was my life. That was, I mean, that was what people sought me out to do. And I'm repenting of that, Yeah. you know, and it's, yeah. it, the, the interesting part is that I think that there, it has to be Christ. It's the orientation towards Christ that allows you to be silent because I think underneath it all, and at least this was true for me, is there's a there's an understanding i always had an understanding that the silence and allowing the truth to stand was gonna necessarily mean suffering for me and it's only the the person who's silent the person who says no just no um you know i'm I like seeing seeing you know the the stories of the 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 new martyrs during mm -hmm. you know the er, the nineteen twenties and whatnot, and how many times it would be a priest or a bishop or a monk brought in front of the communists, and they say, "What do you have to say for yourself?" Mm -hmm. You know, and they say, "Glory to God for all things," mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's and and then silence mm -hmm. because you know, like, well, you know what comes after, mm -hmm. you know, you know that it's death or mm -hmm. suffering, physical suffering or whatever it is that comes after, but it's that the truth, the truth is so valuable. And for me before, if it's not Christ, then I think most people see the cross. So they see the cross and they say, not, not me, not me. Like I can't go to the cross. So let me roll out a story. Let me roll mm -hmm. out a justification. Right. 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 Let me. Oh, no, I I this and oh, that and that. No, then let me. And well, you, let know me that's, that real you, know, you know, that statement uh, that's, uh, where words are many, sin is not far. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's true. Um, where words are many, sin is not far. And I think that's one of those things where when you when you recognize that, you know, in society or in yourself, it, it's it's. It's kind of tough to back away from it because it feels as if sometimes that um, everything hinges upon it, that you have to make these things happen. You got to kind of keep digging the hole. But the fact of the matter is, is there's something very profound in, in knowing where you stand. And I think this is, I just want to say this real quick, because I think this is a really great point. For a lot of people, they get hung up on the fact that they feel like they need to defend the faith. Like, they may feel like, you know, their family doesn't understand what they're getting into. Like, why are you becoming what? You're orthodoxy? What? What's the deal? And they get, they get trapped. They're tempted into falling this, into this trap of like, I got to know the, I got to know the answers. I got to be able to like, and Yes, okay, the scripture says, you know, let our speech be seasoned with salt, you know, give every man an answer for what for what you believe. Like, okay, there, there's a true, there's there's a point to that, but I think in an equally valid and especially now, maybe an even more effective understanding is that you don't have, like you don't need to defend anything and not not in an arrogant way, but in a way of humility 
you know, sometimes, sometimes there are these things that just because you can't articulate something doesn't mean it's, it's not true, right? And, and I think the hubris of, the, the hubris that we find ourselves, you know, kind of falling into of like needing to prove and articulate and all these things, um, especially our, prove and articulate God, you know, like if you stop and think about the fact that if you, un, if you had all the answers, maybe what you found isn't God. You know, if you have all the answers and everything is, you know, real, real crisp and clean and buttoned up, maybe what you have is something else. Maybe you've, you've stumbled onto um, a really nice fraternity or something, you know, but when you're talking about God, and especially for us, this is the big thing about us, you know, a core thing in regards of Orthodox spirituality is maintaining, respecting, and thriving to some degree in the mystery. And, and, and what is unfolding and what is being revealed. You know, this, is, this tension is, is absolutely necessary so that we can, we can be reminded and be in that proper orientation towards Christ, which is, he's the master, not us, right? We don't, we don't have all the details to, to unfold everything. We're not, we're not meant to be. And I just think people should just be aware to not fall into that temptation. Like, oh, I gotta, I gotta have, I gotta know all the answers. I gotta know, I have to know everything about history. I have to know every single detail about this or like, I'm gonna look like a fool. And the, the concern there is that like, you're concerned about looking like a fool more than you are about experiencing truth and experiencing God. You know, and that actually leads you further away from God, right? Because it, it's, you know, forgive me for going to another kind of relational analogy, but and there comes a point where, you know, I stopped thinking about how to, you know, woo my wife or how, you know what I mean? It's just like, no, like you're just, you're there with the person now, right? And if you're in like that kind of insecurity, that can drive people, that can drive a person away. It's like, what are you doing? I'm here with you now. Why are you still, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not with me. Your mind is focused on other people and other things and yourself. You're worried about yourself. You're worried about how you're gonna look. And it's like, you're not even, you're not engaging me, right? You're, I, I have become this kind of external thing that you are, fixated on and you're using to kind of work out your issues like but that's not that's not relationship you know that's not you're not properly you're not you're actually engaging with me and I know that sounds kind of off but like you have to realize like this is what happens to us when we when we fall into these little um and it happens all the time we can all be guilty of it but when we fall into these little um rabbit trails where we get really into something about the faith versus God. And I just think it's it's really important to recognize this. You know, it's like there's so much about the faith that you can just spin out on, which is great, you know. Um, iconography, Byzantine chant, rubrics, ecclesiology, hagiography. Uh, I mean, we can just, you know, um, political history of the church. Like we, you can spin out all these things and really miss out on Christ. People can be in the middle of the whole thing, be, you know, people can get spin out on, on collecting prayer books or collecting whatever and, and, yeah. and not pray. Sure. Like that's, and a non-Orthodox can do all of those things too. That's something that a sure. non-Orthodox can, like you could be a, a PhD in religious studies with your focus on Eastern Orthodoxy and not be Orthodox. Let me tell you, you something. I, I, gotta, I gotta put somebody on blast. Um, I'm tired, so my defenses are down. So maybe this would be some good scandal for people. But um, there's a guy. He has a he has a, a, a it's a good it was a good blog. Um, I know who you're talking about? It was a good well maybe not it was it was a good blog. It's about icons icons interpretation I think it's called and very informative, very informative. I, I just can't read it, man, because. 
he's he's got really great information um i think at some point in time like he he worked in a museum he was he did some curation or something like that and that's how he kind of like stumbled onto the icon and became just really interested in it but this guy he's so he has no reverence you know and he just he knows more about icons than than you know seminary and trained priests you know i mean he knows a lot about icons and has nothing but disdain for god you know so yeah he'll, he'll talk all day long about like you know icons and he'll just be taking these pot shots like well they think this they think that and to him it's just it's a hobby it's a fascinating little thing um you see this all the time you know there's there's these moments there's these points where people you know i've been to a few of them i i don't like to go to them i i, I I don't go to them anymore. If they do come up, I try not to. But like, there's a there's a point in time in the early, early and mid two thousands in California where there were several museums that at times would have exhibits of the icon, you know, um, several of them, you know, and uh, all up and down Southern California, San Diego. I, I went to a, a good portion of them, um, and it's weird. It, it's weird and it's weird because well, that's you, not the place for an icon it's not the place for an icon it, it's an icon is not a museum piece in it and you can feel that and this is exactly what you're saying Cyprian, is that it's like these people who have no reverence no no love for god whatsoever or the church but they'll respect it as a as a historical piece i mean the soviets would could respect it as you know the the ministry of historical affair or whatever like it doesn't they can look at something and be like okay i can look at the material value of something as a piece of history or whatever but that's you know it's like the man who looks at his wife she's like yeah you know she's a great pair of loop and a you know great pair of eyes and you know, i mean like however you want to do it like that's and and that's about it like the trophy wife and that is not it that's not where it's at you know, and, and people can do that with Christ and with the church, you know. The, um, I mean, this is, this is really, this is really interesting because something, I mean, we've been, we, we may as well talk about it, like, because there's, mm -hmm. seems that there's something, something going on. There has been something going on, clearly, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of there's a lot of people moving towards orthodoxy right now. And some of it I think is because of the well I it's it's not some of it. I think a lot of it of the individuals now are looking and the reason I mean I'm just going to I'm I'm going to just say because this thing is coming up because of Cernovich, so I should just I should just, you know, mention Right. And I don't know one way or the other. I haven't really followed whatever, but this is a, he's he's a, he's a very much a political influencer. Right. And but it's not just him. Like there's other people in my orbit that is the same way, being attracted to orthodoxy. And for some of them, I know that it is definitely a spiritual thing that's occurring with them. Like I, I know that. And I can't say one way or the other with the people that I don't know. And, and I'm sure that it is definitely there is a, a spiritual aspect. But I see. For many people, a lot of people right now are looking around because institutions are falling apart, institutions mm -hmm. that people had trusted. Um, you know, you, you bring up this, whole, this idea of the desire to know everything so that you don't feel stupid. But if the last two years has showed us anything, that desire is exactly what makes you look stupid. Yeah. All of these people with the science trademark and, oh, we know the science and we're following the science, except it always changes. Every two weeks, the science is something new, meaning you didn't know anything. Your models were wrong. Your assumptions were wrong. Mm -hmm. Everything was wrong, right? Because you didn't just stop and be in the moment. Right. And so people are seeing this and I know that it makes them feel like their entire world is crumbling around them the entire edifice that they had built up even if they talked mess about those oh i don't trust these things whatever still we're raised in this environment you know we're raised in a modern world it's like oh science doesn't work anymore this doesn't work anymore so even i know even there's something in people in their spirit where they're like ah, i want something solid to stand on i'm among, i'm among them 
right? So like, I'm not excluding myself from out of this. Maybe it just happened to me sooner. But one of the things that I'm seeing is, is that while it is that no, because they're seeing orthodoxy. And I mean, I think Cernovich even sort of, he, he, in different words, the spirit of what he was saying and some of the things where he said, I'm in an orthodox rabbit hole. What he was saying about it was what, what, was, what he was feeling was, oh, here is this institution. I'm going to use that word like, I'm, I'm going to put it in quotes. Here is this, I'm, I'm not trying to get into his head, but what I saw was, here's this institution that has said that no. Like, no. And that's it. And then gone about doing what the tradition says to do. I want that, but I want it because the no. Like, I want it because I want to say no, mm -hmm. as opposed to I want it for, I don't, and I don't, I, I'm not trying to judge him on this, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying that this is, this is from my own feeling of seeing like my own views on this coming in is the, the temptation to say, I want it because of the no and not, I want it because of the truth that will allow me to say no when I need to, but that will allow me to say yes when I need to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think one of the things that's really important about right now, one of the reasons why things are kind of different is that some, a lot of people are being exposed to the church, but they're being exposed to the church in a really kind of like uh, shaky time, actually, um, where let's just act like it's just really us here, you know, and no one's listening. And like, the fact of the matter is, is that um, there's been plenty of capitulation from quote unquote orthodox in regards of um, the powers and principalities, you know, and in, in the both the literal material understanding of that statement and the spiritual understanding of the statement, which encompasses all of it, right? So the spiritual, when I say spiritual, we're not talking about just the invisible aspects of it, but the totality of it, right? The totality of it is the material manifestation which people encounter and the, 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 the root motivation of it, which is internal and, and invisible to the, to the to the uh, naked eye. So this is real important to say because I think a lot of people, if they come in on the elevator pitch of, you know, back in the day it was 1054 and talking about the West, right? Well, now the elevator pitch is, you could say the Orthodox Church doesn't, isn't given in to what the to whatever this, the mandates or the wokeness or whatever it is. The, the, the Orthodox Church isn't giving into the world what the world is doing. And um, for all those people who are looking for that, I want to say absolutely like the church isn't, but like if you don't know what you're, if you don't really know what you're looking for, you, you're going to be disappointed because, you know, the, the leader of the largest quote unquote body of quote unquote Orthodox Christians in America is so duplicitous and um, you know, so eager to be in bed with the worldly powers. If you don't, if you don't know what orthodoxy is, some of I, I fear that some of these people can come can get into the sphere a little bit through maybe some of these influencers who aren't orthodox yet or who are just barely orthodox and they kind of don't understand some of the unfortunate kind of nuance and dirt. You know, they don't understand there's a matrix within the matrix, if I could use that term. And some people who are genuinely looking, and even some people who are maybe looking just for that, that, that solid institution, like you're saying, I, I'm all for that. I, like, this, there is a solid institution here to, to, to find, actually, but you need to know what you're looking for, because there, there are these forces which are not solid, and they are happily in bed with the government and with the world in the wrong ways you know what i mean and i think this is just really important to bring up because you know this whole thing about you know i mean god will use it you know it's like that guy 
you know the you know the story that the kid who goes to camp looking for chicks and like something happens to him and he actually has an experience you i was gonna I mean? say be of good cheer anyone who's of uh, like involved in that because i was that guy yeah i was the guy that came to orthodoxy like oh yeah it's it's a ch- total rejection of western christianity oh yeah this will piss my dad off you know like type of thing but like not really but like that was my motivation and here i am you know? yeah i mean it's it's real and so i don't want to poo poo it so much because i mean it's like yeah i mean god will use it but i just think now's a real important time and i think i feel this is an important conversation to have and we have fun at what we're at what we do, but I think it is important that we talk about these things because there's, I hope there's some people who can really try to read between some of the lines of what I'm saying here and really understand that like, don't stop short. Don't, don't just look for what you think is some sort of solid institution, um, but go deeper for Christ and really look for you know, you know that there's something deeper. You can feel it. You can sense it, but it's going to be tough because no one's going to really articulate it in such a kind of like hard, you know, ham-fisted way. But what you're looking for, the depth and the truth is there. It's Christ. But now more than ever, you have to be, you have to be of a, of a certain mantle. To, to kind of get through it. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Actually, um, you know, there's a kind of, a, again, through you, Cyprian, a kind of roundabout channel, a young man in Korea, right? He's one of those, he's one of those people where I go like, this guy, because he exists, I don't want to hear excuses from people. You know, I mean, alone in Korea, like, you know what I mean? And the, he was he was going to one one church, right? And very difficult, very difficult, you know, um, on all the points, you know, really buying into all of the 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 koofy madness, all the stuff, right? Very difficult, not wanting to really kind of like in the right ways, you know bring him in and, and speak to him about Christ, you know, but he be, but he's hanging in there. And eventually, you know, I'm talking with him, encouraging him. And he just, I'm encouraging with some simple things about prayer, enduring, you know, just Christ will, Christ will deliver you of this, of a, he will reveal something to you if you will endure, right? He who, those who endure shall be saved, as it says in John, right? You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a couple months, but eventually, the Lord opens up a door and now, I mean, he has a relationship with a hierarchy and, you know, he's being, he's being initiated and catechized and, you know, learning iconography and all this stuff is opening up to him. Right. When he had nobody before, like alone, that's, that's what I mean by the power of Christ and, and, and Christ. Let me, let me just say this story. St. Anthony, the great, um, he I believe this was very early on in his in his asceticism, but by this time he's 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 already doing the hermit. He's already he's already doing the, the hermit thing, and he was assaulted one night by the demons, and like physically assaulted, actually assaulted, and he was assaulted to such a degree that he was at the edge of dying. And as he's basically laying there and he's, he's looking up and he's just, he's, he's, he's dying. He's like, this is it, you know? Um, and he, Christ appears to him. And St. Anthony, he looks up and he says, like, where were you? <laughs> you know, like I'm, obviously you're here to take my spirit. Like you, you, you let them literally beat me to death. And the Lord says to him, Anthony, I desire to see your fight. I desire to see your contest. And from that point on, Christ blessed him and, and he was strengthened. And that's where he becomes like the St. Anthony that everyone knows, the St. Anthony is just the great, 
was mentored by and like, you know, this is, he now moves out from this place of, of temptation and, and death. Um, and I find this to be true in all of our lives. Like, man, you're, you're gonna, you right now in the church at large, we're at this point where it's just, and we ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> we ain't seen nothing yet, right? But like saying, like, like Blessed Sarah from Rose says, you know, the temptations of, of the believers of the latter times will be of such a psychological nature, you know? And for so many people, they're just shaking their hands like, what's the deal? You know, I, I thought for a lot of these people that can come in, I thought this was the, the church that said no. I thought this was the church that didn't give in to whatever. And it's like, yeah, it is. But you need to know what that means. Because if you're just going by the externals of institution and the externals of just political sociological conservatism, you're going you're gonna to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there's a bunch of people in the church right now in the spirit of Pontius Pilate. Because remember, Pontius Pilate, he, like King Saul, is just trying to save his neck, right? He doesn't, he doesn't really want to, like, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to go against Christ. You know, he tries to do what he can. He feels guilty at points of time, but he's, he doesn't, he, he just wants to play it safe down the middle. Was he afraid of, like, in, like experiencing reprisal if he, like... Yeah, because Caesar... Like Caesar put him out there and it was his job as a prefect there to, to keep down, you know, any rebellions. That was his job, right? And it was his job to make sure that there wasn't any waves happening, right? So he just wanted to keep everything smooth, right? And this Jesus, this rebel rouser, I mean, he's, he's causing a lot of problems, you know, and he, he just wants to keep it smooth, man. Right. And there's also there's also a kind of there's also a kind of secular virtue in that to where and it's the same sort of secular virtue that we've seen over the last well through through the through the dumbness if we want to call it that and and it's this idea of like well no I'm I'm doing this I'm staying in the middle of this thing i'm i'm erring on the side of caution i'm doing okay yes but i'm erring on the side of caution for the betterment of like everybody because you could see pontius Pilate saying like okay look maybe i'm i'm looking at this guy here and i don't see any problems with him but look over here the elites of this society are saying there's a problem if I go and I, you know, use ju the proper judicial judgment in here and go off the truth of this, that like, no, there's actually no problem here. Well, then what if these guys start a rebellion going? And then even for their own people, it's like, then I've got to bring in centurions. Right. They're going to kill a whole bunch of their own people. There's right. going to, it's just going to be bloodshed. So even for the sake of them, that I might not have to put them up on a cross right you know i will put this one man on a cross right right and there's been like... so much of that <clears throat> through the dumbness of the last two years mm -hmm. so much of it has been well we're doing this so that this other thing doesn't happen and yeah even though masks don't work even though the poke is getting you know uh, uh it, it's it, it doesn't have a fit it's not effective over this time, even though this, 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 even though we know six feet apart does nothing, even though we know this and this and this, still, still, you know, rather than, rather than live in a truthful manner, rather mm -hmm. than acknowledge the truth that is in front of me mm -hmm. for the betterment of everybody so that there's not uproar in the streets and riots in the thing, I'm just going to go along with it. Mm -hmm. So there and is that, and, and I mean, forgive me, see that right there. It's one, of, it's one of the reasons why it's, it can look bleak on a spiritual level because we're, we're at a time where I think on, on one hand, there's a lot of people who are just getting tired of it, but it's just like, man, just so many, just the masses of people 
I just don't want to be bothered. I just don't want to be bothered. You know what I mean? And it's like, and we're, and we are all asking ourselves this for the most part, what's your line? Cause even now, right. Even now when things, you know, the narrative is changing and people are like, you know, questioning things in a way that they didn't before, you know, and now's not the time to just be like, oh, okay, things actually are going to get back to normal. Okay. You know what I mean? No, 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 no. Now's the time to really remember like, what's your line? Like, like where, where do you draw the line? Where, where is your integrity actually? because it's gonna be tested again, but even in an even more serious manner, I would say. Because the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of us, we, we were all tested and failed to some degree in 2020. And sure, caught by surprise, okay, fine. But for a lot of us, as time went on, we realized like, you know what, okay, this is great because I really, I was shown something about myself and I want to repent of that. I don't want to ever do that again. Right. But the thing is, is do you think it needs, does it, does it need to be as extreme as 2020 was? Right. Do you need, do you need it to be that extreme to really, to really say to yourself, okay, you know, am I living a life of integrity right now? Because that's the thing about, Anyone who's coming to orthodoxy, let, let's just, I just want to encourage you, I, I, and it doesn't really matter where you're at. If you're in a place where people don't want to live by integrity, that shouldn't stop you. You live, in you live with integrity before God. That's what, that's what this is about, right? And, and that living with integrity, that's, that's everything, you know? And so let's say, forget everyone else, I'll just say for myself, for me personally, I'm thankful for that time. And I was like, to, uh, before 2020, I would have liked to have thought myself a man of integrity. And I was shown areas where I was not as strong my integrity as I'd like, and I'm thankful for it. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm trying to show my thankfulness to God by, with his help, not falling asleep at the wheel again. And not taking that not mistaking opportunities in which I can strengthen myself and, and go deeper as opportunities of just kind of falling asleep again and being lax. And because I think that's the thing is, you know, Pontius Pilate and the comforts in which he was afforded, the luxuries he was afforded, the, the privilege he was afforded, the authority he was afforded, the power he was afforded, everyone and within earshot of this if you're lit, if you can listen to this, you're in that seat. You know what I mean? If, if, if you're doing well enough where you can, you know, take the time and, and listen to conversation and think about spiritual things, you know what I mean? If you're in that position, then this applies to you. You know what I mean? And especially if you are Orthodox, you're approaching Orthodoxy, a big part of this is confession. And I don't just mean rattling off a kind of list of like, you know, moral infractions you did, but really doing a, a real inventory of who you are. Every time you go into confession in some, in some regard, you know, how are you, how are you confessing Christ? You know, are you, are you really seeing yourself honestly? Are you, are you seeing the moments in which you didn't have integrity? Are you seeing those moments in which you washed your hands and said, ah, you know, I don't, I don't want to get involved or I don't want, you know, whatever it is, this is, this is of the utmost important for us now, because when, when stuff hits the fan, that's not the time to find out what you're made of. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's now, you know, in these moments of quote unquote, you know, it's not even peace, right? But you know what I'm saying? It's, it's in these moments of relative calm. I guess that's a better word. It's not peace, but we have some calmness. Um, we don't have the frenzy like we did in, uh, in, the, in the confusion of 2020, but it's not done. We're just starting. You know what I mean? There's a, this, this is bringing up for me. It's, it, well, it, it goes sort of 
interestingly back to this Cernovich thing, but I've seen it on a few other things. When people will bring up orthodoxy, these influencers or whatever will bring up orthodoxy when, when things like this happen. And invariably there will be, I mean, there's also this, you know, there is this movement that honestly, I, I get a little, I, I have to say, I do not get a good feeling ab about it. Um, you know, this, this sort of traditional Catholic movement. I, and there are some people who are this sort of the same people, like people are gravitating towards Christianity. I see some of these people gravitating towards this traditional Catholic thing. And it's a very like meme driven, it feels very, it feels like a rebranding of a lot of right wing stuff that has the alt right and things that have been around. Like, I'm not trying to paint them with that brush, but I'm saying that I'm seeing a lot of the same patterns. And one of the things that I see constantly is, and I saw it recently in this video, some, some kind of viral video that someone had of like people in Poland and some speeches in Poland about them and the church and all. And of course they're riling up the Polish Catholicism right now as a part of the, you know, the it, things that are happening internationally with Russia and, and Europe right now. And you know that what, what this is all a part of, right? So, but one of the things that I see, and so that was a long way of saying that the difference that I see is I see that sort of segment and the things that they are talking about as like the cross when it comes to the cross like here is the cross and the cross is on a flag mm -hmm. and the cross is a symbol on a flag mm -hmm. and it is the symbol under which we all gather together and we fight against this thing that we hate mm -hmm. like it is the way that we all gather as a collective and we fight against the thing that we hate mm -hmm. i don't see a lot of that in in terms of i haven't seen a lot of that in orthodoxy but i'm sure that it's that it's there somewhere it's there. It's but it. The retake Byzantium thing. This, right? But but the difference in <coughs> here is the cross. It's not a cross on a flag. Mm -hmm. It's a cross on a hill. Mm -hmm. And it's the thing that I go and get up on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think and this, is, this is what's interesting because I think this is this is where uh, I, I have I have not gone as in depth as most people have in regards of like some of Jordan Peterson's or Dr. Jordan Peterson's approach to it. But this is where I think he's correct in some of the things I've seen in, in which there is this aspect of really understanding you like clean your room. You know what I mean? Actually, very valuable in that sense because. I think the I think one of the only ways for someone, one of the only ways for some people, excuse me, to really move past some of the low hanging fruit and some of the traps of the draw of you know right wing ideology ideology or left wing ideology, right? I think one of the only ways to do it is is by understanding the profound personal aspect of the cross because look uh the zealots right simon zealot the zealots you know and and um so many people didn't understand what <laughs> this is getting to the heart of, of what christ was doing look the road to emmaus okay Christ on the road to Emmaus, excuse me, Luke and Cleopas on the road to Emmaus, okay? And they are speaking about what happened, about Jesus being crucified, right? Being given over to Pontius Pilate, the bad trial of the Sanhedrin, his execution, right? They're talking about it. They're talking about, we followed the master, we thought this and this and that, you know? We were expecting him, we thought he was the one, we thought he was the one who's going to come and, and liberate us from the Romans, right? They're, they're discussing this. They're upset. And, they're, and the Lord appears to them. He, get, he gathers with them on the road to Mass. He's like, are you guys talking about? They're like, where have you been? You don't, know the, you don't know what's up with the news? You haven't heard about this Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified and this and this and that just a couple of days ago? You Like... Haven't you been on the internet, <laughs> basically, yeah. right? 
they're saying this to, to Christ, right? Well, here, here's, here's the thing, man. It's not a coincidence that it's on the road to Emmaus. Because if you've ever read the book of Maccabees, you'll know that Emmaus was the, the source of, the, was, was the start of the rebellion. That, that was one of the first, first areas taken, right? And so he's revealed to them on the road to Emmaus and anyone, and they would have known. Oh, like, I get it. I get yeah, it. Because wow. it. Yeah, because it's like, no, it, it, there's a reason why it's Emmaus because you don't know what you're looking for. You think the Messiah is going to be some political leader. Like that's literally why it's brought up the road to Emmaus. And, and for us, we just, you know, if you don't, many people that's, that's lost to them. But when you understand, like, no, this is one of those points where he's like, no, 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 no. You guys don't know. Like, this is, and he begins to, to show them, look, this is who the Messiah was. Don't you know he was supposed to suffer and be crucified? And, and, and they're like, whoa, what? Yeah, because they're expecting him. They're looking for him to be on a flag. They want the cross on the flag. You know, they want to rally around. They, they want a political leader. Nothing's changed in that sense. It's maybe worse now because we should know better, but in the same way they're looking for a political leader, people are looking for a political, uh, they were looking for a political leader. They thought the Messiah was going to be a political leader. People still want a Messiah that's going to be a political leader now. I mean, I don't mean to pick on him, but that's kind of the whole Trumpism thing right now. This is like, like he is the Messiah, so... Go ahead and popped in and said something really obvious after about 15 minutes of silence. Yeah, so, I mean, it. no, I it's, mean, it's not, it's, it's on the left. It's obvious, it's obvious to us, but it's not obvious to the people who are doing the thing. And, and a lot, and but for, all they have to do is step outside for one second and look in, and it's like, I mean, but that's yeah. so that's so difficult because I mean, like, like, well, what, yeah, it is difficult, it is difficult, and that's why we should be careful not to i mean it's tough like we I, mean, should I be, get it i get like, it Why yeah we don't do we don't have the gravitas of the father so when the father's like call out pontius Pilate. it's different than us because we almost need to be like to some degree with some fear and trembling like god help us so we don't end up like pontius Pilate, right because Again. Pontius Pilate, you, you, you see what I'm saying? That's why people fall into stuff. I mean, the reason why people were so wrapped up in the QAnon thing and like all the crazy, you know, correlations between Trump and his dad being named Christ and Mary, like, the, like all that weird stuff is because people, are, oh, people want a political leader because people, look, man, people don't want to lose their truck. And they don't want, they, you know what I mean? They don't want to lose the luxury of their house. Like the fear of losing their, their convenience, the fear of, of losing their standard of life, people will do anything to maintain it. And that's what the powers are banking on, left or right. Yes. That's what they're banking on. They're banking on, you don't really believe this. And that's, and that's what happened with the Soviets. Like, you know what? It, it, for us right now, it's great for us to, to get rallied up and just be like, yeah, the Russian martyrs. And like, this is that. Okay. I just want to take a moment and let's just not forget. I mean, conservative numbers, help me out. 10 million, right? That's the numbers. Uh, I, I, a 10, 10 million. It can go uh, Orthodox killed. Yeah. yeah I've, heard, like, I've heard as high as a hundred, a uh, hundred and ten yeah. million is what yeah, I Yeah. Like I'm just being so as. super, you know yeah. what? I'm just picking super lowest number. Right. Okay. Can you imagine, imagine how many people just capitulated? We never think about that. You know what I mean? And I'm not talking about the people that went full on, like I'm into it. I'm going to be a full on. Oh, that was a minority, right? Full, full on communist party yeah. member. The whole night. Yeah. Yeah, that was I'm not, a, I'm a, like, not even talking about those minority. cats. I'm not talking about those cats. 
I'm talking about the everyday guy who's just like, look, man, I just want to feed my kid. You know what I mean? Think about how many people were like that. Think about how many people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, no, Slava blah, 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 blah. Like they, they, I go to church, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's like I got five kids. I got to do, you know what I mean? Look, look, this, this is real. This is real. And this is, we have gotten just the, sli- I mean, just the slightest taste of it the last couple of years. We're just getting started, right? But this is the kind of conversations that need to be really happening because this is, this is the greater problem. Yeah, who is it? Who doesn't want to be in the camp of the winner? Who doesn't want to be strong and like will destroy anybody? Who doesn't want to be that, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that this is nothing new. And when you are in that disposition, you often you often become the hand of the enemy, not so much, you know, the the, the wounded body of Christ. And this place of being able to say like. Yeah, I, I'm willing. I'm willing to die. I mean, getting back to where does this come from? Where does this idea come from? Of well, because we talk about this, we've talked about this before. But like, where does this idea come from of being able to say, okay, you know, uh, I will willingly go to, to my death. I'll be a martyr. Okay. Right? Well, when the Maccabean revolt, that one of those, one, I, and forgive me again, but like that first wave of it, there was. Um, before it was formally the revolt, you had these, these, these devout Jews who were like, we are not going to put up with this sacrilege. And, um, you know, they're, the, the, the Greeks are going to, they're going to, they're going to attack us, um, on the Sabbath. Well, heaven as our witness, we're not going to break the Sabbath and fight back. Heaven will be our witness that we will be slaughtered rather than defile the Sabbath and fight back and rather than, than go along with, you know, the defilement of our, of our law and in our, in our God, right? That's where, that, that's where that spirit comes from. It starts there, right? But very few people re- will want to talk that way. Very few people want to go to that, that, radical, that radical route. And so... The reason why I'm just bringing that up again is just because it isn't the Pontius Pilate thing isn't just about like not doing anything in a neutral sense. It, it can go it can go either way too. It can also be like, you know, I'm gonna lie to myself and I, you know, I'll blow off a hundred people's heads before I let them take away my my truck and my my whatever. You know what I mean? And, and the name oh, well, there's, of, there's the name a lot of, Christ, of that talk. You know I mean? There's a What's lot that? of that talk. There's a lot of that talk, Father. Yeah. A lot of that talk. Yeah. Which is, which is, hey, that's fine. But let's just be clear though. Don't don't get it twisted. Because you're not defending Christ. You're defending, you're defending your own neck, which I hey, more power to you. That's great. I just my big thing is let's just be honest though, and let's just be clear. Right. Let, let's not. I'm just all about trying to be as I want to have as as much I respect consistency and integrity. Right. And let's just be, let's, let's just be consistent. Right. Like if if you're fighting for your temporal earthly freedom and your 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 wealth, then just say that. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't need to, you know what I mean? If you feel the need to dress it up with, with some false religious pomposity, something's wrong. Like that, like, you know, that's wrong. You know what I mean? Don't dress it up. Just call it for what it is. Right. Um, And on both sides, same thing with the virtue signaling that and all that we saw, like these Christian virtue signalers and all this stuff. It's like, no, I have to wear the mask because that's the love of my brother. Shut up. No. Like you, that's, don't, don't do that. You know what I mean? Like if, if, if you have this paradigm, but like, you don't need to be disingenuous and bring in all these religious Christian tones, overtones to, you know, validate your, yeah. your political ideology. You know what I'm saying? Don't do that. Like, cause that's, that's all that is. Well, because there's so many other things that, 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 
that could be pointed to that's like, but you're not, but you're, this is one thing. You're not living, you're not, you're not living that principle, that out as a principle in all of these other things that you're doing. And it's also not like you're trying to live them out. You don't even justify yourself that way in these things. It's not like you're saying, well, I'm trying to be better. You know, I'm trying to have more love for my brother. And I know I'm doing these things and it's not that it, no, it's just, it's this one thing right. that you want to do and you're going to justify it. You slap with a religious a justification. Yeah. Slap a sticker on it. Exactly. You slap a sticker on it. And then that's your justification. Um, Father, uh, really quick. I wanted to get back to the concept of, because, and I don't remember exactly where this tied in, but we're not, I remember hearing fairly consistency and then on the way home I was listening to someone talk about it the idea that orthodox Christians aren't pacifists like we don't um yes so what I mean to say is it, it can get confusing mm -hmm. because there's Saint Moses the Black right mm -hmm. there's his example of he was like just do what you got to do you know mm -hmm. and that's what that's and you know countless 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 martyrs just you're going to do it. We all know you're going to do it. Just do it. Stop wasting my time and send me mm -hmm. to Christ. I'm, I'm waiting for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the Balkans and then you have monasteries that have holes that were used for like boiling, pouring like boiling hot oil out of, out of mm -hmm. like people that were attacking them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So there obviously is precedent. And I'm not saying, you know, Hey, let's go retake Byzantium or anything like that. They're like, you know, get, get, you know, a priest to bless your God. I mean, that's not out, but like, where, where would that middle line be? Where's the Royal path in amidst that? I mean, I'm not saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it's tough, right? Because it, it's, it's, it's going to be between a person and their spiritual father. Right. And so I can only speak for my, my children. You know what I mean? I can only speak for, for where, I feel I need to lead, you know, my my spiritual children, myself. But like, um, what what you find in the lives of the saints is you find um, a very clear precedent for the defense of the defenseless and the defense of of your brother, right? And that takes the form of homeland, all that stuff. Like, there's there's a place for that. And I'm not anti that at all. I'm, I'm not a pacifist, right? So let's, let's be clear, I'm not a pacifist. Um, but there is the real path, there is, is, you, is, see, here's the thing. You, as human beings, as men, we are to feel, to know, to experience, to love, to pray deeply about things, right? And so, we should be like, this is the problem with where we're at now. Nobody thinks it, nobody really thinks about things a lot nowadays, right? I mean, forgive me, uh, here we are blathering our mouths and giving our opinions on YouTube, but like so many of us are, have our opinions formed, excuse me, we are informed by people's opinions mm -hmm. versus having our souls formed by the lives of the saints, the teaching of the fathers, the Holy Gospels, and the experience of the Holy Spirit in our life, right? You, you see what I'm saying? So I'm reticent to say, well, it's this and that, but I would say, well, in the lives of the saints, we see that there is there are saints and there are moments where these saints are, are given a blessing by God. They're giving a, uh, they, they, they demonstrate to us a love of, rather a love of homeland and, and, and a clear duty to defend those who are without defense. That, that's there. All the, all the warrior saints, that, that's all there. Saint Nestor, that's there, right? The trick is when it came to themselves. The trick is when it came to the things that were those things that were tempting them to a less than Christ-centered sacrifice. That, that was the difference. That's when they said no, right? You don't, see, you don't see the saints 
taking up arms necessarily to defend wealth and happiness. You see them taking up arms to defend, again, the women and children that be sold into slavery by the by the hordes, you know, like, go ahead. I'm sorry, Father, uh, and forgive me, maybe I got this wrong, but you actually see that in the Old Testament as well, that like God didn't bless wars when it was about the Israelites, when it was just about like accruing territory. Like it wasn't when it's it, in the it, laws. It's yeah. in the laws on warfare. Yeah. It's, oh, I mean, yeah, it's there. So like, you know, from my perspective, any man that wouldn't defend his wife and his children, any man that would defend his sisters, which include the wives and children of your brothers, you're not a man. Amen. You're, you're not a man. You know, I've, I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear about that. You're not a man. That's your job, right? Um, but your job is also to know and to hear the call of the Lord and, and, and to discern these things and to know, you know, when the Lord, when, to know what the law of God says, right? And we know the law of God through prayer, through the reading of scripture, <laughs> the reading of the lives of the saints, the reading of the fathers, like we will know the law of God and we will obey his commandments. And so this is, this is how we, we seek that real path is, yeah, I will defend, you know, my wife, my children, my sisters, whatever. I'll lay down my life for my brother. But I also recognize that um, within me is the potential for great darkness. And God forbid that I would ever become, become the man who would defile a man's wife and, or a man's child or you know, what I, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. God forbid I become the person who needs to be defended against. That, that's the thing that you have to keep it. And that's what no one talks about in some of these, I, I don't wanna say it's, it's too hyperbolic. That's the thing that I feel must always be brought up in these conversations, forgive me, is we, we must be people to say, I, I'm capable of, of committing atrocities. I need, I, I, need to, I need to acknowledge that and to know it so that God can keep, keep that darkness from, you know, from overcoming my heart. If, you're, if, you're not, if you don't think that at all, then I would say to you, you're probably not a Christian man. Because if all, you, if all you can think about is like, I just wish somebody would. If that's <laughs> how you think. I just wish yeah. somebody would. I don't care what flags you have on your wall. I don't, I don't care what you have to, I don't care. If that's how you really think, you know, not joking around, not having to be with your buddies, but like, if you really think that, like, if that's the movements of your heart, you need to repent and you need to seek Christ because that's not the spirit of a Christian. A Christian doesn't long for the opportunity to murder someone. A Christian doesn't look for a Christian doesn't long for someone to violate their rights. They have an excuse to, you know, legitimately kill someone and to do violence. That's not, a, that's not what a Christian does, right? A Christian realizes, you know, may I never have to use this sword against someone. There's like, there's still even a penance for people who kill oh, someone. Yeah. Justify if, if you, yeah, if you're a faithful, good soldier, like a, you are like a legit, pious orthodox christian and you murder someone in defense of your country yeah you still have the penance but that penance it's for your healing sure. it's not a punishment it's for your healing because the church recognizes that murder and violence these things leaves a wound on your soul well even the material from the materialist side i mean the, you know when talking about post-traumatic stress disorder you know, they say it's generally not what was done to you. It's generally what you did. Like most people who hmm. suffer from terrible PTSD, it's not because they were a prisoner of war or these types of things. Actually, those people wind up relatively like put together, uh, especially if they're with other people, the camaraderie of being a prisoner of war. Those guys are actually usually okay. It's the ones who did terrible atrocities. And it's 
because they're haunted. Yep, they're haunted. The what they did haunts them. They're haunted. So the 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 penance for healing makes like it makes so much sense. I mean, Father, what you're saying about keeping front of mind this and acknowledging I am someone who can do atrocities and acknowledging that as a Christian, Mm -hmm. like acknowledging that, yes, I am a Christian. Yes. And I acknowledge I am still a person who is capable of these atrocities. Mm -hmm. I I think for these individuals that I'm talking about where, you know, they want to, they're putting together videos with clips of, you know, um, whatever the, uh, the movie about the crusades with Orlando Bloom, I'm forgetting, uh, kingdom, of kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, with showing like the crusade, like the crusaders, like marching. And then the, here's the flag with the cross on it. And they're putting all of this together. And it's it, the fact that there seems to be a blind spot of, well, no, no, no. Like you're not going to be, if you're going to get, everybody together and you're going to go and and aggressively defend oh no we're defending we're it's a preemptive attack of defense right we see so much of that like this this narrative of like no it's this preemptive attack i'm going to go kill this guy so he doesn't kill me first basically like i don't like what this person's doing so i'm going to aggress against them that what's missing out of that it's like i don't know why it hadn't occurred to me and you say that but what is missing out of that is the idea that like no, you're capable of great evil. Mm-hmm. And if you put yourself in a situation where you're like moving in that direction, are, are you capable of pulling yourself off of that path once you've started down? Like have a little more humility. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's speaking of the creed and the creed being the fruit of the ecumenical council of Nicaea, you know, um, the church isn't preemptive. It, the church is, is responding to errors, you know? And I, I've always found that very interesting that the, the church, you know, we, we see in ecumenical councils how the church operates. You know, she chooses to respond, right? And it's not really preemptive on these things. And I just think there's something to be said about that. Listen, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. You know, like... And, and, and it just sucks because this, again, this isn't about being cowardice. This isn't about being a pacifist at all. You know what I mean? Like I just said, you don't defend your wife or your children or your sisters. You're not a man. You know what I mean? That's your job is to defend them. You know, and I, and I do mean defend them, right? But this, this is, look, it's tough. But this is what it means to be a Christian. This is the royal path. You know? Um, if you're a Christian, what that means is you're a little Christ, you're a little anointed one. You've you've decided to take on the mantle and anointing of 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 the Christ, right? You're so you need to follow His way, right? And this is and this is the way. And I don't really see any other way around it. You know, I mean, um, Czar Lazar, the great Czar Lazar of Serbia. You know, my son's named after him and rousing his troops to, to take on the, the Turkish hordes, knowing that they'll be defeated, you know? Um, I think this, this, uh, this word of, you know, no greater love as a man than to lay down his life for his, for his brother, I mean, this is definitely what Pontius Pilate did do. He didn't lay down his life for truth or for love or for any of those things. In fact, Pontius Pilate, the spirit of Pontius Pilate is saving your own skin and neck. Yeah, yeah. I've heard, and we don't have to get into this, but I'm guessing that in certain branches of orthodoxy, I'm not sure. I did some cursory looking into him before I remembered, let's just not go to the internet. For any information about him uh that some people revere him as a saint that who? like uh, I, that seemed like it was some orthodox people who, who? oh pontius Pilate. Oh, i've never heard that before 
Yeah, it's that it was an article. It's like why some Orthodox consider Pontius Pilate a saint, but um, delete that. That's foolishness. I didn't know if that was <laughs> the first something there that I just didn't. But I mean, actually, uh, going back just a second, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. Um, I mean, how often in like storytelling do we see? Um, huh, but uh, preemptiveness being a form of tyranny. I mean, um, always. Yeah, I mean, always. That's the Galactic Empire. I mean, is will crush any chance and the offshoot mm-hmm. that there might be some disorder. So we'll crush all forms of you know anything that might be disorder. We'll I, for, forgive me. I just any movement like that is a fundamental denial of God. Yeah. Like those, like those. Well, it's a lack of faith. It's a complete lack a, of faith. It's a complete lack of faith. It's a, it's an absolute complete lack of faith, and it's, um, and and I, I think it's one of the logical conclusions of a materialist perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and and I think this is the thing, kind of circling back around, um, because forgive me for going there. I I apologize if this is distaste for cheese anyone but i i welcome anyone you know just as a priest and as an orthodox christian just as a man i welcome anyone who's actually interested in in orthodoxy like none of us i'm growing in my awareness of christ every day you know um and i just the doors are this is this is the kingdom of heaven this is the hospital this is this is paradise the church is paradise, right? Um, and so everyone's welcome, but I would just say that like, you know, understand, you know, when you come, when you, when you approach the gates, know, know what gates you are passing through, know whose gates you're passing through. Because let's just be really straight up about this. It's not about this, this world like this everything of this age is 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 passing away and no matter what no matter what you you're going to guarantee yourself six months five years what what are you what are you going to guarantee what are you ultimately going to gain and lose the potential for eternal life right and that's the thing is ultimately that's what we're talking about is eternal life and that i know that's that's trippy talk right like what do you what do you mean eternal life yeah, what do you mean eternal life we mean the life that is without end so understand that you're absolutely, when you come to Ortho, if you are, if the door has been opened to you and God has opened up the potential for orthodoxy to you, understand what you're being called to, you're being called to something very radical, actually. Yeah. But don't, don't get it twisted. You know what I mean? Don't get it twisted. It, it isn't, it isn't the radical movement. It isn't some, some guerrilla radical, but it's nothing like that. It's, it's even crazier. It, it's beyond that. <laughs> I was talking with a brother from the church and we were talking about, and he kind of blew my mind a little bit and I don't want to puff his head because he's a listener, but we were talking about how come, uh, how come it is so hard for my daughter? Why does my daughter get so tripped up over stuff? She's three and a half, but she just, she stumbles so like of course she's three and a half i recognize she's not perfect of course but i mean i'm talking about like she watches like a half hour or an hour of tv and she's just a monster the rest of the day she eats some candy you know like a little bit of sugar and that's all she talks about she knows that she's going to hang out with a friend in like three or four days and it's all my wife is hearing about and he kind of this guy kind of broke it down for me he was like well yeah she's baptized like how like because I was like none of that stuff really tripped me up as a kid or at least it wasn't visible to me 
like I could watch TV for hours and then my parents come and shut it off and I'd be like, okay, fine, you know, whatever. Then I just like move on. But like that, because she's like losing that grace because like she's been instilled, she's like responding, father, correct me at any time if I'm wrong about this. Like she's, she's, she's been in a liturgy. So things are fundamentally different for her. She experiences all of reality completely differently than when I was a kid. And I wasn't baptized, you know, like I see other kids who can watch iPads, play video games, whatever. They're reasonably fine. I mean, they're monsters in their own way. Sure. But like she just like something happens, you know, like and I've talked with other parents who feel the same way, you know, of parenting Orthodox kids and either it's a preparation for times to come. Maybe let's not rule that out. But it's also like this thing of like, no, from the moment she was 40 days old things were just entirely different for her than they were for me. Like, cause I wasn't baptized into the Orthodox church. I never went to liturgy. I didn't receive Eucharist in the womb, you know, like those are all things that are just have made her reality completely different from mine. And then that's- hey, Since you're saying there's a sensitivity there, is that what you're saying? I think that's the words I'm trying to find is that there's a sensitivity there that disturbs her more. She's more disturbed easily than I was as a child. As a child, I could- handle a number of amount of things that she's just not able to handle and not not even disturbing things just watching mickey mouse clubhouse whatever stuff on you know well, the thing is is uh, <coughs> excuse me there's a callousness that um because the the inverse of or the opposite of sensitivity is callousness in that sense and there's a callousness there that you experience that you know but i, I think I think is, that's real um is the callus then like taken away at the liturgy like to you know he, he, here's the thing um it's difficult right it, it, it's difficult because um too much to the one much is given much is expected and there is there is a reality that uh we do ourselves a great disservice by living this life half-heartedly. And, and people who, um, I've seen it, I've seen it a few times. I, I've known some people who have come to the church, maybe with not the best intentions. Many of us haven't necessarily, or some of us have come with an ignorance of certain things, which is fine. The problem is, is that you can't, that's not tenable. You can't sustain that. Mm -hmm. And those people end up leaving. And they, the reason why they end up leaving is because you are encountering the living God unveiled <laughs> here. And, it, and you can only go so far with that before you either break. It, you know, the scripture talks about in regards of, you know, the stone falling on you yeah, you know, and, and you'd be crushed to powder versus you falling on the stone and being broken, right? It's better that you fall on the stone and be broken than the stone falling. And that that's kind of what we're speaking about here. Is that this is why so this is why for at least in our circle, 2020 was the biggest blessing. Because for a lot of us, for all of us, there was some degree to some degree, wherever you were at, where, where the Holy Spirit called you to say, no, you, you have to go deeper. You have to be more consistent. You can't half step. You've been to wherever you were half step in your life. You can't half step like that anymore. You, you have to get in or get out in that sense, right? And this isn't about hitting it perfect. That's not it at all. Hitting it perfect has nothing to do with what we're talking about, right? But it's either like you dive in or, or get out, you know? Okay. So and I wanted to say this earlier, and this is the last thing I'll say, is that you're talking about um, political ideologies and, you know, um, people like really holding on to that. And I've seen it. Uh, I see a lot of that get shed during Holy Week, especially like um, during Holy Week when we're in the services that we're in, the amount of services that we're in. I talk to people who are got it all figured out 
one way or the other left or right and then i talked to him in the middle of the holy week and they're just like i just don't know i just don't know if i know you know i just don't know if i know what's going on it's like like finn going through this the deserts of jakku you're shedding your like armor on the side of the road because it's just like weighing you down and you can't hold it anymore and it's just like tossing all this stuff off to the sides it's like yeah i mean you could be a trumpster or a you know a biden head or whatever they're called and then it's just like well okay well good luck i mean in this three-hour vigil like let's see what happens on the other side of that like i mean i guarantee it probably some of that's going to get shed because it's just weighing you down i mean at a certain point so all right that was andrew's corner to wrap it up what is real quick doesn't have to be a big thing what is your guys's favorite fast food restaurant not nice stuff fast food restaurant and what is your favorite meal from there oh boy it's been a while since i've had fast food I'll i was gonna that. ask we've only got we've only got mcdonald's here and uh Did you ever go i think i've been to mcdonald the mcdonald's here one time at the behest of my daughter who wanted a shake yeah um my oh no but i i know i know what it i know what it i mean i'm a californian so it's in and out it is a uh double double when i was when i was eating when i was eating red meat which i'm back to doing now it would be a double double animal style mm -hmm. fries with cheese melted on top mm -hmm. what is animal and style animal style is uh extra everything mayo but they chop up the pickles and the onions. They they chop up the pickles, like a relish, put them in the mayo, the, 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 rel the relish, yeah, and they grill the onions. So instead of just putting the onion on it, they actually grill the onions, put it on, and it's double cheese, and uh, then the fries with the cheese on it and a strawberry shake. That's wow. it right there. And if you're a Californian and you don't say that... <laughs> i'm revoking your cali card that's it <laughs> well you might have to pull my card man. okay go ahead <laughs> you might have to pull my card because as time has gone on this is an interesting thing andrew do you want to make a big thing so i won't but i had this little yeah. thing with my kids where i was like i was in texas don't say ago. whataburger don't say whataburger no 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 i'm not okay. i'm not I was in Texas and I passed up an in and out to go to Five Guys. And I never thought that, I know, I know. That's what I said too. That's what I said too. I never thought the day would come. But you know what it is, is in and out has the worst fries. I've never liked their fries. Oh, their I love fries. their fries. Their fries are soggy. There's nothing to them. Oh, I love but them. what kind but, of fries are they? Huh? What? They, 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 they make they make them right there out of the potatoes. They, but they Five do Guys has way five guys better does, fries. Five Guys does that too. Five Guys does but that. Five Guys has way better fries, right? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. For me, it's Del Taco. Because I, I was, I, I, I thought, I was, gosh, I missed Del Taco, <laughs> man. Oh, to have, to have, you know, a combo, like two Del Taco, just regular yep. tacos, the crispy tacos and like a, um, a combo burrito, com double beef combo yep. burrito. Yep. And they have their strawberry shakes. It's actually have like actual strawberries. Strawberries, oh. and it's re and it, and it's open twenty four hours. You know? Oh yeah, and they have the crinkle cut fries. The crinkle cut fries. I mean, oh, I I mean you know the th the thing is yeah, in a, Del Taco's Del Taco. up there. It's up there. Yeah. It's up there. Yeah. Well, okay. What about you, Andrew? Oh, I don't eat that garbage, guys. Come on. <laughs> I don't eat that no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I said we should rush through this as a mercy to you, Father, because I wanted to get you home to bed. Um, but uh, I, I actually, I don't know, man. I mean, from Missouri, I would have said Taco Bell. I think Taco Bell still probably like my go-to. I'm on the road. I see a Taco Bell. I'm okay, yeah, we're going to do Taco Bell. There's like Taco Bell and Wendy's and Burger King and whatever. It's like, okay, yes. yeah, we're going to do Taco Bell. But I mean, recently, just I started eating meat again. I hate to say it, but I mean, Chick-fil-A is pretty amazing. Like, Chick-fil-A is awesome. Yeah. I get the hype. I truly get the hype. Like I've never, I've always been like, it's really expensive and I don't really like waffle fries. So I don't really know. But since I've started eating meat That's again, I think I've had it like three times, I think. And each time I'm like, man, this is good. This is just really, good. Really, really good. 
I will I will probably never have any of these ever again. So it's very interesting that like I will only ever have the nostalgia of the taste. Yeah. They will probably never ever be accessible to me again. Come visit Missouri at some point. You'll probably come at some point. Then we'll all go to Five Guys together. <laughs> oh, there you go. That deal. Yeah. I've never been. I've never been. So we should good. check it out. It's good. Um, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I really liked the QA. Uh well, I actually thought about maybe trying because people are still asking questions. Um, so I think that maybe. Another one before too long wouldn't hurt. I'm sure we can round up three more questions. Uh, that was really good. Sure. Um, but other than that, I think that's it. And again, the landing page, um, I've heard some people say that they've got technical difficulty. I'm sure. I don't know. I don't know what that's about. Yeah, I've looked. I've looked at it. Should be. if so. Yeah. Yeah, we'll figure it I out. I don't know. Somebody yeah. could if, if, if you have an exact thing and somebody's got a screenshot of what's happening, if you don't see the thing show up. Um, Cyprian at royalpath.network. Send me an email and um, please, with the screenshot, it would help me to try to fix this if there really is an issue. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. And um, I'm tempted to say to pray for Russia and Ukraine, but I don't really know what's going on there. If everyone could keep that in prayers, I don't know what's happening there exactly. I'm not following it super closely. And then I don't know like the layers beneath. So I'm just like, just kind of like, you know. For the peace of the whole world, you know. At yeah, peace of the whole world. Amen. Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys.